corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. I'm sure maybe all of you or most of you have experienced in your own life how the word of God can get life going, so to say. I mean, how it has transformed your life or how it's completely changed how you lived your life. I mean, there is power in, in the word of God. I think we have a lot of, a lot of things to learn from that lesson. Uh, before we move into the, the parable, I want to talk a little bit about this germinating principle that is quite fascinating. How a seed can more or less, being dead, just come to life, so to say, to germinate. And uh, yeah, every good seed at least, every seed has the power. God has put in the power of life, the power to germinate in every seed. And if we take that spiritually, I think in the same way, God has put life in this book, so to say. God has put life in every Bible verse that we read or meditate or memorize. There is life in the Bible, in the Word. I would say that God's Word have the same power to germinate as a seed, like we heard earlier today or that we're going to hear about in the week has the power to, a mustard seed has the power to become a big tree. And I think a small Bible promise has the power to transform and change our lives. In John 6, 63, it says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are, what are they? Their life. Can I see the hands of you who have experienced the, the, the transforming power of God's word, changing life? Yeah, amen to that. I see a lot of hands come up. Would you say that this life-changing experience, is it something you get once in a lifetime? And then when you go to testimony meeting in church, you start to say, 35 years ago when I read the Bible, it completely changed my life. And you share that story every week, every Sabbath, more or less. Is that how it's supposed to be? How often can you grow microgreens? <laughs> yeah, you can have one that gets ready every day. Do you think it's similar in the Bible? How often can you get spiritual life from reading the Word of God? Hopefully every day. Yeah, you can. It depends on us. There is life in the, the Word. Here's a nice picture summarizing the, um, the parable we read. And as you can see, you have more or less four different types of soil or four different types of ground where the seed actually comes. You see here the bird eating it up and you see it at the soil and you see the weedy soil and you also have the good soil who brings a lot of fruit with it. And I would say that in here and every person actually in the world are in one of those four categories. Everyone. And uh, the, the tricky thing is to know where are you, so to say, and, and you don't have to raise your hand. You can just think about it yourself as we move on. Which group am I in? And the focus, I hope, in, in this um, talk today will be, be on how do we make our soil or our hearts, how do we cultivate our soil or hearts to bear a lot of fruit, so to say. I think there are some principles you need to be aware of. Um, I think one of the main points of the story that we need to remember is exactly what it says here. What the story is about is the effect on the growth of the seed by the soil into where it is cast. Uh, that, that means importance. I think we should read it one more time. What the story is about is the effect of, on the growth of the seed by the soil into where it's cast. And I, th I think you can make it quite easy to understand that meaning can be quite yeah, hard to understand in a way. If you sow a, a vegetable or a carrot, for example, in, in a very bad soil, yeah, the, the, the growth will not be tremendously good. It will probably not grow super good. Uh, and if you don't get a lot of water or not a lot of sunlight or a lot of nutrition to it, it will probably not become such an amazing carrot in the end. And uh, it's the same. If the Word of God, if you read the Word of God, or if you hear the Word of God, 
but your heart is somewhere else, there will not be a lot of growth in it. So the, the whole point of this parable is to show us that the effect that the Spirit, the God's Word have on us depends on the soil, depends on where our heart is, so to say. The soil represents the heart. And to look briefly on the four different groups, the first group talked about the wayside, and Jesus himself gives actually the interpretation. You can follow along in your Bibles if you want to, and I will read from Matthew 13, verse 19, and it says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed on the, by the wayside. So what does this mean in simple terms? What kind of people does this represent? Is the, is the listeners, so to say, are they very attentive or are they very sleepy? <laughs> yeah, they probably didn't do a lot of exercise. They were probably quite inattentive. They didn't listen. They were, didn't understand the word at all. So you can say that this, this group of people are usually absorbed in selfishness. Life is all about themselves. Life is... It's too fun or it's too interesting to, to worry about the future or to, to think about others. Uh, this type, you probably know a lot of people in this group. It's people who are in the world, they are not interested in, at all in spiritual things. So when they hear a sermon or if anyone says something to them, it just goes in this way and out this way and never comes back more or less. Um, so these people are usually self-focused absorbed in sinful indulgences. Uh, it means a lot of sinful habits, uh, bad habits, so to say. And they're so stuck in it that they don't have any spiritual interest. Uh, they have paralyzed their spiritual faculties. More or less, they, they, don't, they don't have any spiritual muscles at all, more or less. What's important is that, that I think you need to remember is that anyone in this group can change. You can change from being in the wayside to the good soil or to the stony ground or to the thistles or, or thorns. So you don't have to stay on the one. But here you have people, primary people who don't call themselves Christians, people who are calling themselves probably atheists or, or some other religion or agnostics or whatever. Um, but they're usually not so interested in, in Christianity or the Bible. And what's interesting here, as you can see, the seed can't even germinate in this kind of environment. So this is a very bad environment for any kind of fruit trees or plants or, or any kind of growth. Because it, it doesn't even germinate because it doesn't have the right surrounding and the birds eat them up, so to say. So um, that's the group number one. This one might come a little bit closer to heart, because I, I, I imagine that all of us who are here are more or less interested in spiritual things, otherwise we probably wouldn't be here. But this group is for spiritual people as well, in stony places. And Jesus says what it means in Matthew 13, 20 to 21. And it says, But he that received the seed into the stony places, the same is he that heareth the word and uh, uh, let's see what it says there. Yeah, and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So what kind of people does this represent? Is it Christians or not Christians? Yeah, it's Christians. Um, yeah, happy day Christians, exactly. It's when everything is fine, when the sun is shining, they are rejoicing in the Lord, so to say. It's the, um, yeah, it's a very positive attitude. And, but what happened, as it says here, when tribulation or hard things happen, what happened to the root system, so to say? They are shallow Christians. Um, you can say that they have a superficial religion. It's... It's like the stony places, it doesn't have a deep root system. 
when there is uh, no rain for a while, they dry up and, and they doesn't really grow in a good way. Uh, and uh, when I read the, one amazing book that you probably have heard about is the book uh, Christ Object Lessons by Ellen White, when she comments on this, uh, this parable. And uh, it's a very interesting part when she comments on the people in the stony ground. So I would highly recommend to, to, to dwell and to read and to meditate in that chapter because it's really, really deep. And she talks about how these kind of people, they, are, they, don't, they have selfishness of the natural heart underlies the soil. There is no true conversion in these people. This is like shallow Christians who, who never really have been born again. They are more interested in heaven than they are about the cross. It's more what's in it for me attitude. Um, and this group of people have not seen the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And what I think is interesting when you read the Bible and when you read Ellen White's writings is that the closer you come to God, what happens uh, in your attitude towards yourself? Do you, do you think yourself is usually more holy or not more holy when you come close to God? Yeah, you, you, you think you're unholy, so, of course. And, and uh, that's what she says in the end time. When we come really close to God, we see our own sinfulness, so to say. We see our own need of God. We see our own uh, evilness, so to say, in our heart. But this group of people, if you ask them, they probably say, I'm a good person. I, I give Thai, I eat healthy sometimes, and I exercise every week, and I go to church. And Yeah, I mean, they see themselves as good people, but they haven't seen, they don't understand their need, they don't see the sinfulness of sin. And uh, this is a quote from that book. And I think this one summarized quite good the stony heart people. And they say, Many receive the gospel as a way of escape from suffering rather than a deliverance from sin. Do you understand that difference? It's more the attitude, what's in it for me, so to say. I mean, what is the, I can get eternal life. I will get a good life here in, 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 on the earth. Jesus and God will bless me. But they don't see anyone, they don't want to be delivered from their sinful habits. That's, that's not what they aim for. So um, that's why this group of people, they usually grow a lot in the beginning, uh, so to say. But when harsh time comes, there is no deep root and they give up their faith very easily. And what I thought was interesting when reading the comment of this chapter and, and, and dwelling and meditating on it is that it seems like these people they do not believe that Jesus will give them power to overcome their sins. And uh, I don't know if you have uh, been around that long in the Adventist church as well, in the, in the Christianity in general, that it's becoming more and more popular now that you can become saved in your sins and not from your sins. I mean, you can continue to sinning willfully and be saved anyway, but that's not what the Bible teaches. And these kind of people, they... They don't believe that God can give you the power to overcome their sins. Many claim to serve God but have no experimental knowledge of him. As we heard before here, you need time to, with God, you need, you need to have experiences with God. And they do not crucify self. Self is in the lead, it's what's in it for me, it's a self-focused religion. And they don't want to give up their favorite sins. And we all know we maybe have things we struggle with. But these people, they don't see anything wrong in, in, in practicing their particular sins. So um, this is not, they're not born again. You can summarize this more or less with the Pharisees, the disciples before Jesus was crucified. It's, they are not born again Christians. And Ellen White points this very clearly. She says, their only hope is to be born again. They need the seed of God, the Holy Word, the Bible, to transform their life. As we read in the beginning, this is the incorruptible seed that can transform lives. And uh, what needs to happen is that love must be the principle of action. We do not belong to Christ unless we are His holy. It must be a complete surrender. It must be a, um, you can't just give our hearts 90%. We need to do it completely. 
And uh, here summarizes the stony ground very good that Ellen White says. He says that the effort to serve both self and Christ makes one a stony ground hearer. He will not endure when the test comes upon him. And it's like Jesus is saying, you cannot serve both Christ and mammon. You cannot serve the world and God at the same time. And this is what the stony place hearers are. They, they are Christians, but they serve self and Christ, and that will not end in a good way. And uh, I'll tell a story tomorrow, on Saturday night when I have my next meeting that I've never shared before, and that's a passionate story that I experienced last year. It was a, a, a deep fight with God that I did one year ago. And during that time, that I'll tell you more about on Saturday night, I studied and read quite a lot. I felt that God led me to, to really read and study the great controversy, the last book of Ellen White's series on, 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 the, on the big conflict between God and Satan. And um, there's some really powerful quotes that I'm going to share from there. And here is one of the powerful quotes, that we live in such special times and Satan is so after us right now. And uh, this is a quote that I read during this, this uh, wrestling match that I had again with God a year ago. And this really stuck to my mind and I wanted to share it. And she says in the, in the book Great Controversy that temptation often appear irresistible because through neglef neglect of prayer and study of the Bible. It's quite fascinating. Many times we probably have experienced that. We, we have a bad habit, a sin that we are struggling with, and we, we pray to God and we try to overcome it, but we fail time and time and time again. And Ellen White says that many times it is because we neglect to take the prayer and study of the Bible for real. The tempted one cannot readily remember God's promises and meet Satan with the scripture weapons. So what she's saying more or less is that we need to study the Bible so deeply to put the word of God into our minds so deeply that when we stand in the temptation that the Holy Spirit can remind us of the Bible promise that we should have studied that we probably didn't remember. And that's why Satan can overcome us. Because you know what happened when Jesus was tempted three times? The scripture says, for it, it is written, it is written, it is written. Every time. I think this is a Really, really, really powerful quotes, and I can highly recommend to read the last third of the great controversy during prayerful attitude, and you will be richly blessed. Uh, I'm going to share one more quote from that uh, from that book on page 622. This is really awakening in a way, and she talks about the end time that we're living in now. Corona, I think, is just a warning, so to say, we're coming close. The time of trouble, such as never was is soon to open upon us. You hear that? That's, she wrote that 150 years ago, more or less. And we shall need an experience which we do not now possess, and which many are too indulgent to obtain, too lazy, more or less. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. I have a church member in my home church that he is very the worrying type. I don't know if you have any people who likes to worry and, and you, 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 you are afraid of everything in, in the future. and you, It's much worse usually in your mind than when it actually happens. And he, does, he doesn't like this quote because here it says, imagine how bad it will be in the end time. And Ellen White says here, it will be greater than you can imagine. So it's, it's not great. Uh, and then she continues, the most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal, and here comes the punchline. In that time of trial, every soul must stand for himself before God. And I think the high point of this quote is this part here. We should need an experience which we do not now possess, and which we are too lazy to obtain. And if you read this book, and uh, you will understand that Ellen White likens this experience with, with Jacob's time of trouble, and, uh, and she talks about how Jacob was wrestling with God. You remember that? And she says that in the end time, that's the experience that God's people will have with God. It have to be a wrestling. You have to come in tears 
close to God and really get this deep wrestling game or wrestling match with God. And that's what I think that we need. Okay, move on. Among the thorns, that's the third group, the third type of people. And Jesus says in Luke 8.14, uh, it's actually interesting. If you compare Matthew and Luke, uh, there's one word that is added in Luke that is not in Matthew. And that is actually the word pleasures. I think that's one that's in interesting. Uh, at least, he says this, and, they, and they that fell among the thorns are they which when they have heard go forth, uh, are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. What is the problem in this group? Thorns, they can suffocate plants. I don't know how many, how many here love weeding. How many have weeding as their favorite part of their garden work? Can you raise up and see? <laughs> No one, almost no one raised up here. Yeah, this is the weeding part. <laughs> the thorns and the, and the bad things that grow. And I mean, what, what happens if you don't weed, if you don't take away the, the enemy uh, garden, so to say, what happens to your own uh, favorite plants? Yeah, they suffocate. They won't grow up. They won't be big at least. And they won't be what they should be. They won't bear the fruit that they should do. And I think this is a very good illustration, actually, what will happen to your Christian life if you, at the same time, as you read the Word of God and, and you try to invest in God, you invest in other things in your life uh, in the wrong way. And Ellen White says, actually, if old habits and practices and the former life of sin are not left behind, if the attributes of Satan are not expelled from the soul, the wheat crop will be choked. So she's more or less saying, if, we don't, if we're not born again, and if we don't give up the bad old habits we have, they will grow back. It's like taking away the weeds. If you don't take the root, what happens two weeks later? Yeah, they're back again, aren't they? So this is the thorns. Um, yeah, here you can see myself and my daughter. How many of you have done cross-country skiing before? Can I, I can, you can stand up, uh, some exercise, you can get some plus points. Oh yeah. yeah, all of you have exercised, it's nice. Isn't it uh, very nice? How many of you would love to come to Sweden and do some cross-country skiing? <laughs> yeah, I hope everyone, <laughs> that's good. Um, yeah, this is actually in Norway when I was visiting, but uh, I love cross-country skiing. I'm from the northern part. I think Rebecca told uh, that we met the first time in, in an eastern camp up in Slussfors. It's a, a youth camp uh, that the Adventist Church in, in Slussfors organize every year. And you go out the mountains with snowboards and cross-country skis and uh, downhill skis. And, and you, you go into trees with your scooter and so on as well. Some people do. Uh, and it's, it's a, a camp where you, where you go outdoor in the days and you have um, uh, usually um, meetings in the morning and in the evening in a spiritual message. So you combine being outdoor in nature with, with um, uh, spiritual aspect on the evenings. It's a very nice way of also introducing unbelievers, so to say, those who are interested in Christianity to come. So we have had a lot of blessings up there. But I've always loved, at least, to, to do cross-country skiing. And, and I, I, as a physiotherapist, I love exercise. And um, I don't know, how, how many people love exercise here? Can I see hands again? Yeah, that's good. Uh, how many wish they loved exercise? <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's good for your health. How many exercise, even though it's boring? <laughs> Can I see the hand of you then? Yeah, that's good. Exercise is very important, but gardening is good exercise as well. But cross-country skiing, I usually say that to, to my patients, one of the best types of exercise is cross-country skiing, swimming, and walking. Because all of these, they involve more or less the whole body. Cross-country skiing, you really get the whole body working. You have fresh air, it's outdoor, and you, you really get the heart going, so to say. Swimming, it's the same. You really involve the whole body. And, and Ellen White talks a lot about walking briskly, quick, fast walking. is really good for, for the whole system. Ice skating, yeah. It's almost like cross-country skiing, so that comes to, in the same, more or less. Yeah, it's very nice to do the ice skating too. On the lakes, it's super. Um, but one thing that I've done a lot is different types of exercise. And sometimes it become, become too much as well. And in this chapter, she comments actually, when she says that sometimes 
worries in life or pleasures in life can actually suffocate your spiritual life. And it doesn't have to be exercise, it could be music, it could be fashion, it could be movies, it could be books, it could be anything more or less. But this quote really stuck to my mind when I read it, and I think you will like it too. It says, the more the desire for pleasure is indulged, the stronger it becomes. And uh, let me ask you an honest question. Uh, do we have any computer games players here who's been, uh, when you were younger, maybe were, were really playing computer games or, or, or other games? Yeah, so if you're raising your hands. What happened, I played a lot when I was younger too. What, what happens when you played for three, four hours? Do you usually feel like playing a three, four hours more, or do you feel like now this is enough? <laughs> Maybe some people are kids as well, and you can see this. Uh, computer games and social media and, and most things are very addicting, isn't it? I mean, the more you do it, the more you want to do it. And uh, if you think uh, athletics, for example, in sports, when it com competitive sports usually, it's very also addicting. I mean, the, the, the more you do it, the more eager you want to do it again. And the more you, you play these games, the more you want to do it. It's the same with alcohol or coffee or whatever, sugar, for example, as well. So I think we've all maybe felt the desire for pleasure or just enjoyment when we do it more than we should or we do it with the wrong attitude, it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And uh, in my life, I've experienced this when it comes to sports, for example, and also with games. And um, sometimes I think God actually has to do radical things. And I will share more about this on, on Saturday evening, what he did in my life. And uh, I had to do something radical to get my attention. But I can say this much, that the more I did... I've, I've done... Uh, have you heard about Vasaloppet, the longest ski run in Sweden, or in the world, it's been many years. It's 900 kilometers long cross-country ski run. And, and uh, it has a long history. And you go from Salen to Mora. It's a king in Sweden, like 500 years ago, it went this this thing, and, and now 15,000 people do this every year. Go from uh, Mora to Saren to Mora, it's 900 kilometers. And uh, I've been doing that quite many times, and when you exercise for that, you become so absorbed in it that that's what you think about, and that's what you're looking forward to the next day, to do more preparing for that and more exercise. And when you do that, you probably experience that your spiritual interest decline, because this is so fun. This game or this sport or this interest, this hobby of mine is so fun, so it takes all your energy. And uh, another experience I have, uh, yeah, you see what a professional table tennis player you have on the picture? That is my daughter when she was one year. We, we tried to teach her some ping pong table tennis at an early age. When I was around 13, 14, 15, I played a lot of table tennis and um, uh, competed and, and was quite active and uh, I felt, I really liked it, but I also felt a pull that God was pulling me in a different direction. And um, you know that age when you're 14, 15 years of old, it's a lot of decisions you make and a lot of uh, where you will go in life depends a lot on th those decisions. And the pastor in my home church, he asked me also to become part of a Bible study uh, group uh, preparing for baptism. And I did that. And um, I felt this pull of, of spending a lot of time playing table tennis and wanting to like, become better and more advanced in that. And also that God wanted my attention at the same time. And I had this wrestling game with God for a few weeks, I would say, a few months maybe even, where I was reading the Bible in the evening and, and like praying to God, what should I do? I... I I felt that if I give up my table tennis and don't can play that, life will become so boring and, 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 and uh, not fun anymore. And I had this, yeah, game, this attitude that you can imagine teenagers can have, and maybe us older as well, that I didn't really know what I should do. But then God spoke to me through his seed that is incorruptible in a mighty way. And uh, one evening, actually, when I was praying to God in, in, uh, for assurance or what I should do, uh, I was reading through the Bible and I was reading in, the, in Psalms and uh, I just continued to read where I was and God spoke to me maybe in the clearest way I've ever imagined or, or experienced in my whole life. And the verse that I actually read was the verse Psalm 73 and verse 25. And that was also the text that was read on my baptism a few months later. And the verse says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? 
and there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. And when I read that verse, I had this fight inside my mind. Should I choose to follow God with my whole heart or pursue a career in, in table tennis and, and really get that going on, so to say? And when I read that verse in, in a praying attitude, tears came down my, my eyes and I just felt this inner peace and, and the assurance that, I mean, if I have God, nothing on earth can even come close to the peace and meaning and happiness that I can experience in that. And I probably took my most important decision that day that I wanted to give my life to God and I've never regretted that. And um, I've experienced that these thorns and thistles can suffocate your spiritual life after that and before that. But I've never lost this attitude that I know that the peace of God can only come when we are wholly, fully devoted to Him. So if we move on to the good soil, the group that we want to be in, it says uh, in uh, Luke 8.15, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Here is where we get the good things, so to say. And Ellen White actually comments that it's not the persons who are sinless, so to say. I mean, it's not perfect people who are in this category. She says that, it is the heart, it's not the heart without sin, but he or she has a desire to know the truth. It has a lot to do with the attitude and the willingness to be led by God. And I think this quote is, is powerful. A knowledge of truth depends not so much upon strength of intellect as upon pureness of purpose, the simplicity of an earnest, dependent faith. Uh, and I think this is important. The pureness of purpose and our eagerness to wanting to hear the truth. The attitude is much more important than the intelligence. There was a man in America named um, Brian and he was part of a really, yeah, really interesting group of people. I don't know if you've heard about this group of people but it's called the Anti-Madagascar Club. Have anyone heard about the Ante Madagascar Club? It was a club that they, they were convinced that Madagascar was just a made-up thing. I mean, there is no place named Madagascar. They didn't believe in the existence of a place called Madagascar. And they had meetings on this, and they had conferences like this on, on the Ante Madagascar topic. And they tried to convince people, Madagascar is just made up. People are just fooling you. And they were so sure of it. And Brian was part of this group. But you know, one day he did something radical. Do you, can you guess what Brian did one day? Part of this exclusive Mad anti Madagascar club. Huh? He went to Madagascar. Yeah, he booked a ticket to Madagascar. He, go, he wanted to see if this really is true. Is there no place called Madagascar? So Brian, he booked a flight and he went with the flight and he, he fell down. I almost said he, he flew down and landed on this island called Madagascar. And he was amazed how beautiful it was. This is actually a picture of it. And he tasted the food and, and how delicious the food was and he experienced the sand and the water and the beach. And, and he was so excited. So he called one of his friends in America and like, hello, hello, Gary. I'm, can you guess where I am right now? I oh, know, I don't know where you are. I'm in Madagascar. Madagascar, you silly, you foolish. Madagascar doesn't exist. No, 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 it exists. I'm here. I've experienced the food. I've experienced the water. And my belly has even grown. Um, and how much he tried to convince him that it didn't exist, it was no use. I mean, Brian had experienced Madagascar. There was nothing in earth, nothing could convince him that it didn't exist. He'd even tried the food, he felt the consequence of eating good food. Uh, and I think this is what God wants with us as well. Education secured by searching the scripture is an experimental knowledge of this plan of salvation. We need to experience God. We need to have an experimental knowledge in the Bible. And I think when we have wrestled with God, like Jacob did, then I think we are prepared for the time advanced as well. We need this deeper experience with God. And on this topic of cultivating your soil or cultivating your heart, 
Uh, I think this quote is very strong. Merely to hear or read the word is not enough. It's not enough to just read the Bible. He who desires to be profited by the scripture must, must do what? Meditate. Meditate upon the truth that has been presented to him. And I think this is core understanding. Because many times when we just skim through the Bible, we don't really have our heart in it. We don't get so blessed by it. But when we meditate, think and reflect and picture in our mind like Madagascar, like seeing it in front of us, then we will be richly blessed by reading and studying the Word of God. I mean, how do you cultivate good soil? Uh, and if we bring this to a spiritual aspect, how do you prepare your heart, so to say, to help the Word of God to grow in your heart? I think it has a lot to do with what, where our mind is. I mean, the heart is a picture of the mind. I mean, what do we think about? What do we do during the days? What do we talk about? I mean, Ellen White says in the, in, the, in the Steps to Christ, what we love to talk about and what we love to dwell on in, in our conversation, that shows quite a lot where our heart is. I mean, if we're only discussing uh, soccer championship, how uh, uh, I heard the Germans lost. Yeah, and the front, if anyone from France here? Yeah, I heard they won against them. And if, if, if everything, anything, everything on our mind is what happens in the world or the sports and the news, that's where our heart is as well. So if you want to cultivate a good soil where the word of God can grow, we need to think, do, and meditate on holy spiritual things. And one of my favorite passages in the Bible that has been really become really close to me the last few years is actually in Proverbs 2, verse 1, 1 to 5. And here you have so much, so much good things. I have have made it read the, the things I think is most important. It says there, My son or my daughter, if thou wilt receive my words and hide them, hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, and here comes the punchline, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. I think this highlights more or less the main point that I want to present today. If we want to be spiritually blessed, have a good soil, we need to have this deep seeking experience in the word of God. Not just skimming it through, we need to seek for it like for treasures. We need to search for it as for gold. And here is a punchline too. God bids us fill the mind with great thoughts, pure thoughts. The soul dwelling in the pure atmosphere of holy thought will be transformed by communing with God through the study of the scriptures. You see here, the way we get transformed and get spiritual life to grow is through thinking about pure thoughts, meditating about scripture, thinking about holy thoughts. That will actually transform us. Many times you've heard, you are what you eat. Have you heard that? You see these big uh, Americans sometimes in other countries as well. You eat junk food, you become very big. In the same way, if you eat or think about unholy things, you become what you think about. So if we want to become more like Christ and grow spiritually, we need to think holy, great, pure thoughts. By what you think about, you become transformed. Uh, and here, back to the great controversy that I mentioned about earlier, it says, we are living in the most solemn period of this world's history. This is strong words. I mean, the most solemn period of this world history. We need to be guided by the spirit of truth. Every follower of Christ should earnestly inquire, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That's the question we should all ask God. And she says what we should do. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord with fasting and prayer, and to this word come back again, and to meditate much upon his word comes again. We must meditate much upon his word. We should now seek a deep and living 
experience in the things of God. We have not a moment to lose. I think this is one of the most powerful quotes I've ever read by Ellen White, actually. And she talks about our time when she speaks about this. And I think exactly like Jesus says in the parable, we need a deep experience in, in the Word of God to get an experience like this. We are closing in to the close now, so I hope you don't fall asleep. Um, and here she says, None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand for the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than man? This is what's waiting in the future. In the near future, we all have to stand before God, choosing to follow the world or following, following the, 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 the Bible. And it's only if we are fortified. And that's meditated, deep study. I mean, it's not just surface. It's really fortifying. Uh, I think that's really important to remember. If we do that, we will be a fruit. And uh, I want to have you guess this. This uh, apple tree here you see on the picture, it's actually an Ingrid Marie tree, tree that I shared earlier. Can you guess how many kilos this tree gave last year when we were harvesting our apple tree? I want to hear some guesses and see if someone knows. How many kilos? Uh, this here, 300 and 500, 600. Yeah, one tree. That's some good guesses, actually. It's in between there. This one actually gave 400 kilos, one tree. I think that was the record for our tree, but we picked up some neighbor further away. I think they had 600 kilos in one tree. So, I mean, that's the experience we want to have. I mean, that's the kind of so fruit that our spiritual life should bear. And that's what I think is the goal of agriculture, to have abundantly rich fruit and vegetables. And I think this is the, the, the goal that we all want to reach. That says in Psalms 48, I delight to thy will, O my God, thy law is within my heart. I mean, when we want to do God's will, I mean, we're not forced to do it. And when we do it our, by ourselves, so to say, I delight to do thy will, O my God, then we have come very far in our spiritual experience. And the fruit of the Spirit... Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. This is what a life meditating on the Bible actually will, will show. So, a summary. Where are we? What group do I feel like I'm in? Am I in the, the birds picking up the thing? Or in the rocky soil, in the weedy soil, or in the good soil? And no matter if we feel that we are here or here we can improve and come there. And I think no one is perfect. We can always come deeper with God. And I think the word of God, the seed of God, is the purpose and the goal that we want to come closer to. So to summary what we have said, we have four different types of soil that we all are in. We have started about the germinating principle of God's word. I mean, God's word is so powerful. I mean, you probably have a lot of favorite verses and promises in the Bible, and you've experienced how they really have spoken to you. I will share some amazing stories about that in two days, about last year for me. But we've all experienced this fantastically germinating principle of, of God's word. In order to cultivate our heart, we need to remove these stones. We need to remove the thorns, the bad habits and the, and the, the distractions that we have. And we talked about how do we make our soil or our heart a place where we can have 400 kilos of apples next year. Uh, and that is searching the scripture like a treasure. We need to dig in the word of God. We need to meditate on Jesus, think uplifting, positive uh, holy thoughts in order to receive this. And what we read some quotes about, the summary of this is, in order to survive, so to say, the end time, we need to get a deeper experience with God. We need a wrestling game with God. And I want to leave you uh, with the last slide here. And this is a challenge that I want to challenge you. It's from Steps to Christ. And this is a challenge that you probably read many times. And this is a challenge for every day. She says, consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O Lord, as wholly thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. 
This is a weekly matter. Oh, <laughs> I was checking you. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. And here is the core. Surrender all your plans to him to be carried out or given up as his providence should indicate. Thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. It's an amazing quote and it's an amazing challenge. And it's not easy, but that's the challenge that I have for you. And before we, we finish with a word of prayer, uh, my wife Julia will share um, a song and a prayer at the same time, you could say. And uh, while we hear her sing, we can contemplate and cultivate the thoughts of the word of God that we've heard today. Simon shared about his struggle and how we realized that he needed to let go, to, to surrender, and the peace that he experienced after. And it says here in Christ's Object Lessons where we're reading about the sower, no outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it. I cannot keep it for thee. Say germinating seed that you want to give each one of us. We thank you for the transforming, life-changing power that reading the Word of God can have in our lives. And we pray that we will experience it not just once, but every day, Lord. And we pray for this challenge to really consecrate and, and give our heart completely, as Julia sang, to you, completely and fully, and daring to die to self and our own plans. We pray for this conference, Lord, and we pray that we can have a revived experience with you as these days we are sharing our lives together. And, and I pray that you will bless each one who listened and each one who's been on the, um, online, and you, I pray that you will continue to bless this conference in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.